ventilation, air quality. Um, we need to worry about the disease transmission uh, versus the respiratory health of animals. Again, do, do we have the bleach in there that's frying their respiratory health? Yeah, it's killing things, that's great. Um, as well as um, fresh air versus, re versus, when I say reduction of dust and contaminants, watch your litter that's kicking up a ton of dust and cleaning and moving things because that's going to be an issue. Um, are you going to have a filtration system or are we mostly going fresh air? Cages that are open on two sides and a window open, that's great for fresh air, but we're also going to be carrying more disease. So we've got the disease transmission to worry about with that fresh air. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth, you know, like I said, uh, w with the fresh air, we're going to have better respiratory health, we're going to have more disease transmission. Um, filtration systems, there's a lot uh, being talked about ozone-based filtration for human things, so they also say it would be great for animals. Um, they're finding that that could be a respiratory irritant for cats, so we might be farther behind by going with this great ozone system. Temperature and humidity is critical. We don't like a whole bunch of changes in that. Um, different viruses and bacteria are going to flourish in, in, in different uh, temperatures and humidity levels. Generally, we need some humidity for a healthy respiratory system, but if they're around wetness all the time, all the diseases are going to flourish and we're going to have problems with that too, so it's a fine line we're walking. As well as something that I really tout from a health standpoint in the shelter is changing them. when you're changing rooms. Um, it's just like us in changing seasons. All of our colds come about spring and fall. Whenever we get the thaw and it gets cold again, everyone's sick. Same thing with the animals, at least from what I think I've seen. So you don't like changing them from one room, from one room to the other. Try and keep things very uh, very steady around there. And again, we got to avoid the dryness. We have to avoid the saturation. So there's a happy beginning somewhere in there. Financial considerations, we're getting the biggest bang for the buck, for sure, from a health standpoint. Um, when we do decide to treat, we need to use medicines that are affordable, as opposed to ones that are too expensive that might shy us away from wanting to treat things that we normally could treat. Um, there's discounts, there's programs. Um, a lot of vets will perform services for us and give us huge discounts. Um, so those are all things to look into. Revisit them frequently, just like you with your car insurance and house insurance. Um, you know, we, we change vaccines here and there. You know, Shearing will do one thing for us, Ariel will do another. They get programs that start and stop. So make sure you're always looking into who's giving you what and where your money's going. Um, the, the more animals we're able to treat, the better off we're going to be in the long run. Uh, prioritize keeping in mind that forever home can pick up where we're left off. So do we have to vaccinate and treat for everything? No. Do we have to do fecals on everything? In the ideal world, we would, but if we're unable to afford it from a time and supply standpoint, then maybe deworming is the way to go, but make sure people adopting would know that you know within seven days they need to have a fecal exam. So we can put some of that on the shoulders of the adopter. Um, you know, lepto vaccines. You know, it's zoonotic, it's an issue, it'd be great, it's very expensive for a shelter to do. Is that something someone can adopt a dog and go to their vet and do? Yeah. Um, do we have the liability of it being a zoonosis? Yeah, so we need to decide, are we going to vaccinate for it? Not a whole lot of shelters do uh, in, for that reason. Humane considerations, chronic versus acute disease. Has it been battling it forever or did it just pop up and is it something we can fix no matter how bad it's looking? Um, that's something we have to look at from a, from a health standpoint. Um, it's critical to fairly prognosticate. Um, just because we can, we have to look at quality of life. Yeah, we can fix a lot of things. We can drag a lot of things out, but is, is it fair to the animal um, to do that? So sometimes we have to just say, okay, this is going to be too long and hard of a road. This animal is too old. It's going to pick up every other disease we have in here. And you know, for us to battle it for four weeks and then euthanize this isn't real fair to it. So we need to be realistic when, when we're uh, setting up what we what we hope to achieve. Feline <laughs> disease. Who's a little ringworm kitty cat? No, I don't know. I'm just saying that. <laughs> um, viral, viral, viral. Cats, definitely we worry about viruses. And we used to treat everything. Antibiotics and IMEDs for everything. They'd see us come and they'd flinch. They were highly stressed in their cages. We did that for the first two years I worked there. And then the next two years we stopped. And guess what? They all got better in a week. Whether we treated them or not. They're a lot happier. We're saving a lot more money. Um, from a shelter health standpoint, the cats did great because the vast majority is viral. Shouldn't ignore the bacteria. We still have some bacteria concerns. Um, so it's still good to do those spot checks and, and, and get those samples out there. Maybe we do have something that te doxycycline or tetracycline is going to cure, and we should start using it to shorten the course of the sickness and get them adopted out quicker. Real quick, um, how, when do you decide to give them that for upper if you don't do it? If you don't do the test and you don't notice bacteria, um, I tend to wait and see what they do over three to five days. Okay. And if they're on the road recovered, I don't do anything. If we're having 
tons of cat scans, so they took the lasting long, then that's time to send in some a panel and see if there's anything you can do anything about. We're getting better, but for a while we were, I think, Really open yeah, even in my private practice, I'll tell you, you know, the sneezing cat having an issue, I tell them, you know, three to five days, give me a call, they're still around, and they're looking worse, or the clear discharge is turning yellow and green and whatnot, and we'll say, okay, let's treat. Um, definitely upper respiratory is one of our biggest issues, and again, stress is probably the, the, the biggest underlying problem with that. Um, gastrointestinal, you know, is it just the diets and the foods and the treats that's giving them the diarrhea, or is it a parasite of some sort? So we definitely need to look into that as well. Um, skin, the dermatosis, skin problems. We've got to worry about the, the uh, transmissibility of it. We have to worry about the zoonotic potential of it. Um, risk factors, we're going to be looking at the young cat versus the old cat, the long hair guy like this. Um, what situation did they come from? Um, to treat or not to treat, that's that big question. Um, we have to look at financially, the number of animals we have in, the adaptability, what we hope to get out of it. So all of that has to be balanced. Um, definitely bring it to the attention of technicians or doctors when you see something as opposed to trying to decide. Um, and will hum and haw sometimes. Uh, quarantine them. Definitely have to be quarantined. Key. Um, when they are sick, keep, keep them out of that general population. <coughs> and that is it. They are cutting me off. So, <laughs>